Good afternoon, class. We're going to spend just a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to give, a, as, as I do with, with a lot of these chapters, uh, provide a brief review of chapters thir no, 7 through 13 for the for the health economics uh, text that we're, we were using. Uh, and it, of course, it was Dwar's text. Um, and just before we get started, there's there's been kind of a, I guess, a constant line throughout all of the chapters in Dewar's text, and it that that constant kind of thread or, or line keeps tying us back to uh, the three pillars of, of especially microeconomic thought. Uh, we're talking about opportunity cost, talking about self-interest, uh, optimization, you know, minimizing, maximizing, and we're also talking about um, marginal decision rule or as you know, individuals uh, in, the, in the market or in the economy, uh, they're making decisions at the margin. So just, just always remember that as, as, as no matter which classes you're taking, um, a lot of classes you can tie it back to just the basic tenets of, of microeconomics uh, and, and especially in this, um, in the health econ class, uh, because we're actually looking at either uh, theory of consumer or the theory of the firm. So that ties us back to the micro classes. Most important thing is, as we've talked multiple times in this class, and one of the, one of, if, if you only take away one thing um, yeah, from this class and put it in your toolbox to use, uh, not only if you, if you go into the healthcare field, either on the payer side or provider side, but in most disciplines you go into, if you're ever in a situation where you can't connect the dots or you're stuck or your you know, direct supervisor comes in and says, you know, I need you to, to analyze this for me or to tell me why this is happening, always follow the money because you can follow the money uh, and you will usually arrive at uh, the answer to any problem. And that's, I've always found that to be helpful. And if there's any one thing I hope you take away from this class, uh, that would be the one thing I would that would try to take away from this class. Uh, and then we, you know, going back to the three, you know, pillars of of economic thought. Uh, always remember the marginal decision rule, and it 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 applies to consumers. Remember, consumers are trying to uh, maximize utility, and they do that when they can drive marginal benefits equal to marginal cost. You've got providers who are trying to maximize revenues and they drive their marginal revenue equal to the marginal cost. Society is trying to um, maximize equality, uh, equity, um, and trying to maximize a net benefit to society. And the way society is doing it is they are trying to equate uh, society's marginal benefit equal to society's marginal cost. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at providers, consumer, society, if they can uh, drive the marginal benefit, marginal cost, marginal revenue, marginal cost, societal marginal benefit to societal marginal cost, if they can drive those uh, so that they equate, then at that point, society or individuals are maximizing their, their net benefits. And that's going to be uh, kind of the thread throughout a lot of these chapters in uh, Dewar's text. And then one of the other keys to uh, understanding is, is kind of a law of marginal, uh, diminishing marginal returns. And it doesn't matter whether you, if you decide to go in healthcare, whether you're on the provider side or whether you're on the payer side, or if you're just making decisions, you know, based on, um, uh, your individual preferences, um, especially if you get out in the work, workplace, you're going to have to sit down. And if they provide health benefits, which most providers, most employers do, you're going to have to sit down as an individual or, you know, or sit down with your family and determine which of these benefit plans uh, most readily suits your health care needs. So um, just always remember that uh, when we're talking about the law of, of diminishing marginal returns, it's after some optimal level of capacity is reached, adding an additional uh, factor of production 
will actually result in smaller increases in production. Um, think about the doctor's office. You go in, you know, your doctor's office is set up in such a way, you know, doctor's office, hospital, it's bricks and mortar. Um, doctor's office may have half a dozen exam rooms, may have, you know, three cubicles set aside for the billing team, may have two, you know, individuals at the front desk taking your information as you check in. And where we're talking about diminishing marginal returns there is um, if the doctors, how many, how many additional units of labor or and additional units of staff can they continue to add to try to drive uh, maximum productivity? And at some point, you, know, you can't add any more labor because you are reaching the capacity of labor because you just don't have the room. And so um, it works on the provider side. If you're thinking about you know, going to work for a payer, whether it's a government or a health plan, same thing. Uh, when I manage the payment integrity team in Buffalo, constantly looking at uh, the law of diminishing marginal returns because there sometimes are just one enough demand for individuals to bring in and have them uh, performing a particular task or function. Um, payers and providers are, you know, they're, they're always, uh, whether it's in the short run or the long run, they're trying to develop, you know, their short run strategy, their long run strategy. Uh, and they're more than likely, at least in my case, every stop I made in the healthcare field, I'm managing them both at the same time. I'm looking at the short run and I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do to increase uh, the financial goal that I am uh, allocated with each year when, when the, the individuals, you know, the powers that be uh, develop the you know, yearly goals and they roll them down to everybody. And I'm always looking at the short run, and, and at the same time, I'm looking at the long run. And remember, when we talked about the short run, that's a situation where you can only, uh, at least from an economic perspective, you can only vary one factor of production, and you keep the others fixed or constant. In the long run, um, all of the factors of production are considered variable because you can change them. You can change labor. You can change capital stock. Uh, you can change natural resources for the most part. Natural resources, most people think of land. So, you know, capital stock and the natural resources, you've got the land, you can, you know, erect a building. Um, you can buy capital stock. You can buy um, new um, computers. You can buy new software packages to improve uh, efficiently efficiency within your team. And then also you've got technology and entrepreneurship that are setting out here outside of kind of the big three when you're talking about the factors of production. Uh, and then we, we moved on down into some, some marginal concepts. And remember that economists love to use the little triangle, you know, little triangle, those of you in a fraternity or sorority, uh, you're talking about the little, you know, triangle is your Greek letter for delta. Uh, delta for an economist just simply means change. Uh, and so when you're talking about marginal concepts, you're talking about change, talking about the percentage change uh, between two variables. If you're talking about average, you're talking about, um, you know, per unit. So average, we, we know, we talked about uh, marginal product of labor. It's, you know, the percent change in uh, total product divided by the percent change in labor. If you're looking at the average uh, product of labor. It's just your total units divided by the number of, of units or the number of warm bodies you have on the labor side. Um, if you're working in a doctor's office, you know, your average product of labor will be, uh, could be uh, the number of office visits divided by, um, you know, the number of warm bodies you have in, in the building. Uh, hospitals, it could be, um, number of admissions, number of emergency room visits divided by the number of warm bodies working in those particular areas. Flip that on to the purveyor side. And, um, you know, in my, ex in my experience, I'm constantly looking at not only the marginal product of labor, but I'm looking at the average product of labor. 
if it's a clinical team, I'm looking at how many charts can those nurses review in a day or how many can they review in a week? Or if I'm looking at analysts, I'm trying to figure out how many reports can they generate during a specific time period. Um, also remember that um, when you're talking about marginal product, um, think about the slope of the curves. Uh, the slope of the total product curve is your marginal product. Slope of the total cost curve is the marginal cost. Slope of the total revenue curve is the marginal revenue. So that, that's where we're talking about the differentiates or the, what differentiates uh, when you're talking about marginal and you're talking about average. And we also spent a, a few minutes, not a long time, but we spent a few minutes uh, talking about slopes of the curves. Uh, if the marginal product, and we'll just use labor since when we're talking about the short run, that seems to be the, the variable that most firms can change uh, more readily than others. Um, so if, you're, if your marginal product of labor is less than the average product of labor, that automatically means average product of labor is upward sloping. I'm, I'm sorry, if it's greater than average product of labor, that means the average product of labor is upward sloping. If the marginal product of labor is less than the average product of labor, that means the average product of labor curve is downward sloping. So marginal, marginal product greater than average, upward sloping. Marginal product less than average, downward sloping. Think about, and then maybe we used it as an example in the class. Think about your grade point average. Uh, you go in on a one semester, you you know start the semester, you're at a three point, and if and if your marginal grade point average for that semester is three point three, you know that your GPA is going to go up. If it's less than three, you know that GPA is going to go down, um, and that's just the way the concept works. And if you if you're going to go again, whether you're whether you go to work for a payer, like a health plan, or you go to work for a provider, and it can be hospitals, it can be you know medical group, any anybody on the provider side. Remember, you're trying to maximize revenues. You are going to be part of a team that is going to help that that firm or that organization maximize revenues. And the concept of maximizing revenues at the margin, it's the marginal revenue product of whatever the factor of production is, set it equal to the marginal factor cost of that factor. And at that point, you know you're going to maximize uh, profits for the organization that you're working for. Um, see what else I've got here. Um, and, and remember, everybody in the healthcare market, and I, I hear, I have students constantly talking about, uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to go work for a not-for-profit firm, and we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, profits. Uh, yeah, you do, because if you're not making a profit, that firm's not going to stay in business. So just remember that you know, everybody, whether it's a health plan on the purveyor on the on the payer side or a, any of the providers, they're in the business to generate profits. And then we spent a few minutes talking about economic grants. And economic grants are basically defined, it's just an extra amount. Uh, that you can earn as a resource or buy a resource, which is typically considered a factor of production by virtue of its present use. Think about physicians. They have a lot of additional training. They, at least in theory, have specialized talents. Uh, they provide services that uh, because of the um, inability um, driven by a lack of uh, um, entry and exit, uh, it, it's, it's, diff it's, it's, I don't want to say a fixed supply, but it is, as we talked about in class, it's difficult to try to, especially from a policymaker's perspective, kind of adjust the supply of physicians as you go out over time, simply because that huge lag, undergraduate degree, medical school, residency, interns, they are spending a lot of, of time and effort and trying to develop those specialized skills. Now, whether they actually develop or not, it's going to depend on the individuals that uh, are trying to train as a physician, but uh, at least theoretically, they're developing a specialized skills. 
if you think about economic rents, I think about healthcare providers, I think about lawyers, um, think about programmers, kind of still up in the air as far as what AI is going to, how it's going to impact the, 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 the market for programmers. But I think of those types of individuals with specialized skills and can drive economic rents, professional athletes, baseball players, basketball players, football players. To some degree, hockey players and soccer players, they have a specialized talent. They can drive those economic rents. And also think about, um, and I think we spent some time talking about it, the difference between a profit, I guess, definition that your accountant has and the economic profit, the definition, the accountant just talks about explicit cost. Total revenue minus total cost. And in the accountant's mindset, it's just the explicit cost. It's the cost that generate a payment, an invoice, a, a, a bill. Um, and, you know, somebody has to write a check. Um, those are kind of the explicit costs. Economists talk about not only the explicit cost, but they try to tie the, the implicit cost in there. And the implicit cost, again, ties back to one of the three pillars of economic thought ties back to opportunity cost. And we talked about, you know, economic, an economist versus an accountant and, you know, definitions of, of, um, of what they thought was uh, the profits. And when we were talking about um, economic profit, what you're talking about is um, the total revenue minus the total cost. And in parentheses, it's Implicit plus explicit cost from an e from an economist view, and if you graphed it, you're looking at uh, the large. You know, you're looking at the vertical distance between those two, uh, between those between those two curves. You've got your at least you hope you've got your total revenue curve up here and it's moving upward, and you've got your uh, total cost curve either uh, it's either flat or you hope it's it's going down because you want to maximize that vertical distance between those two graphs. Um, talked about for a few minutes, just access to a physician's office. And one of the things most people will jump to the conclusion is, well, you know, hey, I, I can't get access to my physician's office. And, you know, I live in Nashville or I live in Murfreesboro or I live in, you know, some other city in, um, in Atlanta or about Maybe you look at from my perspective in, in Atlanta, uh, you, you've got, you can't say that lack of access into a physician's office is due to the um, number of physicians in an area. It can, be, it can be a myriad of issues that are driving that um, lack of access. Uh, it could be a shortage of physicians could be a shortage of support staff to help the physician's offices be more efficient. Again, it comes back to can, can be nothing more than just inefficiency, either in a hospital setting or in a, a provider's office. Their, their production function, that they're taking the inputs, the factors of production, land, labor, capital, technology, entrepreneurship, feeding those factors of production into this black box through their production function, and you know, spitting out office visits on the other end. Or if you're a hospital, you're spitting out inpatient stays or hospitalizations or emergency room visits or ambulatory surgery. It could just be that production function that they're using. It's just grossly inefficient. Um, I've seen that a lot in, in providers' offices. They just, they, they are just, it's almost like they're just throwing things against the wall to see what will work and what won't work. You can also have government interaction. Government interaction can do a lot to impact uh, surplus and uh, shortages of, of, of health care providers uh, in any given area. Um, and government intervention is also, you know, policymakers are always trying to figure out, you know, today, what for eight, let's say 10 years in the future, the demand and supply of health care providers are going to look like. And, uh, government intervention, you know, government can cause a lot of issues for everyone concerned, and uh, it's their inability, it's, it's, it's the policymakers' inability to either uh, understand the information they have, 
or they just don't have the right information. So uh, that's another issue that, that can impact um, not only their, dr their driving of supply and demand of a healthcare provider, but depends on if they're gonna go through transfer payments. You know, what are they gonna do for Medicare Advantage for the older population? And we are, you know, we are a population that's aging. What are they gonna do for Medicaid population? Uh, you know, the disenfranchised, the um, you know, low income individuals, those individuals who can't, you know, survive on their own or can't generate uh, the resources to secure healthcare goods and services. So government uh, goes a long way in um, actually determining um, accessibility to see uh, for any any individual to seek healthcare goods and services, uh, market of you know again we talked for a while about the market for physicians. Um, you know it's it all you know there's a lot of factors that impact uh, the healthcare workforce. You know we talked about barriers to entry, whether it's the government, whether it's American Medical Association, American Hospital Association, trying to control that supply so it keeps you know the the wage as high as possible, um, you know, it, it's, it's a market with, especially on the physician side, with just higher rates of return. Again, economic rents, that's what drives individuals to go in uh, and, and become professionals within the, the healthcare space. Uh, and then it's also driven by asymmetric information. One of the, one of the key drivers of, of healthcare in general, whether you're on the provider side or the payer side, it's asymmetric information. And especially when you're on the consumer side, the asymmetric information does more harm to consumers, maybe than any other any other factor within uh, the healthcare space. Um, see what else? So we talked for a while about vacancy rates and about how you know you know you know how government you know or how not only government but um, either payers in general or on the provider side, um, how they determine vacancy rates, and it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, vacancy rates, you know, you've got the hard cost of, of vacancy of not being accurate on the vacancy rates because you don't understand your vacancy rates. If let's say you're an office manager of a, of a provider group, let's say it's a primary care group, they're all internal medicine docs, and one of them, you know, you're in Nashville, you know, one Friday afternoon, doc comes in and says, hey, my wife and I have decided, you know, we're moving to Florida. Uh, you know, you can have, you know, Nashville, you know, don't like the cost of living. It's gotten too crowded. Uh, we're packing up. Here's my two week notice. We're gone. And so as the office manager, you're scrambling, trying to figure out, you know, what's that hard cost? How much is it going to cost to replace that individual? You know, and if you go with a uh, staffing agency, you know, you've got not only the, the you know, the salary cost of that, you know, provider, but uh, you've got, you're going to have to pay, you're going to have to pay a staffing agency to help you find somebody. Again, it, and, and at that point, as a manager of a, of a, you know, provider's office, you're, you go back, you're going back to that um, marginal, you know, revenue, you know, product of labor, trying to equate that to the marginal factor cost of labor, trying to bring that new physician, you know, on board. You've got some soft costs. That individual walks out the door, and think of think of what it's going to do to the to the remaining staff of physicians you have. They may have to work longer hours till you get somebody on board. Um, they may, um, you know, end up with um, you know overworked, inefficiency. They start making mistakes because they're tired. They haven't worked too many too many hours. Um, it it just there's there's a soft cost involved, and then. And then you've got just the lost opportunities. If you know, every doctor's office has a you know staffing ratio. You know, physicians to patients. You know, you have X number of patients. You have to have X number of physicians for you know X number of patients. So you're back to the ratio situation. And if you don't have those uh, the ratios in line, you may be losing out on contracts that you could negotiate with payers. So. Uh, there's just a lot of interaction in the vacancy rates, and, it, and it's not just providers. It's it's on the nursing side. We talked about that on, you know, on the nursing workforce. 
for you. Um, and I, I can't remember which chapter we talked about, but we talked about um, whether you are on, if you if you end up in a financial position at either a you know, either with a provider or on the payer side, let's say your your direct supervisor comes in and you know says you know I don't you know on a Friday afternoon you know about you know five o'clock you're getting ready to go to happy hour and he says hey you're going to have to uh, go with my network management people we're negotiating this big contract with Blue Cross you know you know, Tennessee Blue. So Blue Cross Blue Shield Tennessee, I need, you know, I need you there to help them. And so at that point, you know, you're going to be thinking all weekend of, of what your negotiation strategy is going to be with those network individuals. When you sit down across the table, you're you're representing the provider side of the house across the table from you is, you know, Tennessee Blue. And they've got, you know, they've got some seasoned negotiators over there. And, you know, you hope the negotiators you're working with are seasoned, but at the end of the day, how does that, how do you establish that range? Um, and go back to your old um, micro classes, or maybe some of your just basic econ classes, and think about, uh, think about price ceilings and price floors. Uh, price floors, you're not going to go below, so you're the provider, you're going to set the price floor, right? Tennessee Blue, is the payer? They're going to set. They're going to set the price ceiling. They have a certain dollar amount in mind that they can't go above. They've been given marching orders from the CFO that says, "Here's the absolute most we're going to be willing to pay," and you're going to have from your financial gurus at the provider group. They're going to come to you, and, you know, and you're going to sit down maybe that over the weekend and calculate with the absolute minimum amount is that you're going to accept so as a provider you're going to set the price floor as a health plan if you maybe you're on the health plan side you're going to set the price ceiling and that's that's the two that's the upper and lower that's where it's going to where the, where the action is going to be all of the negotiations is going to take place between that floor and ceiling so that's that's the that's the exciting and to some extent the frustrating part no matter whether you're on the provider side or or the, or the payer side, and, and trust me, it can get contentious. I've been in some, uh, I've been in some pretty brutal negotiation strategies over the years, and uh, it can get ugly in a hurry. The, the thing you have to remember is, in a negotiation strategy, it's not personal; it's a business decision. They they will they will make comments about you. They may make comments about your mother. Um, but you can't take it personally. It is a business decision. You have a fiduciary responsibility for that firm that you are representing in the negotiation strategy. You're either on the provider side, you're on the payer side. And again, don't take it personally. Business, you have your marching orders. They have their marching orders. They are, if it's on the health plan side, they're trying to minimize costs. If it's a, on the provider side, they're trying to maximize revenues. And at some point, you will more than likely meet somewhere in the middle. And um, it, again, it's going to be a um, going to be an interesting you know experience for you, especially the first time through the ringer on that. Um, and then we talked about you know providers, um, they. Providers are one of the one of the groups that can that tend to drive um, the cost of health care. Referral patterns, um, pharmaceuticals or, or the prescriptions they write for you. Um, we talked about supplier induced demand, supplier induced demand or SID, and that's where uh, you go in to see your primary care doc and your primary care doc owns some stock in a radiology company or owns some stock in a, um, in a, in a laboratory group or they may be part of a multi-specialty group and you don't know when they're sending you for radiology, for lab work or for a referral to a specialist. You never really know whether they're working, whether the provider is doing it because the provider 
thinks that you need the services or the provider is functioning in their self-interest. Again, self-interest back to one of the three pillars. We talked about also um, you know, just technology. Um, and you know, and the main the main issue with technology is, you know, who's gonna pay for it? Um, technology is great and it it, it has a, it brings a lot of value to the healthcare uh, marketplace, a lot of value to the healthcare environment. But at the end of the day, who's gonna pay for it? You've got, you know, laparoscopic a few years ago hit the system, and now you've got robotic surgery. And again, great innovation, great opportunities within the healthcare market, but who is going to pay for it? Um, we talked multiple times throughout the, the course, we talked about, um, you know, the Schumpeter, the Austrian economist who talked, you know, his, his claim to fame was he talked about creative destruction, um, out with the old, in with the new, drives innovation, um, drives entrepreneurship, um, and it's 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 always great not only for healthcare but you know markets just in general. And then we you know got our buddy Adam Smith who talks about the invisible hand and talked about specialization and um, you know invisible hand you know drives markets to equilibrium and prices and quantities. Market forces are you know in the invisible hand they're, they're driving them in a direction of equilibrium. Adam Smith also brought forth the concept of specializations and. And you've gone from, um, and again, my, I guess my great grandfather was a country doctor and he did it all. You know, did the office visits, you know, did some surgeries, did, I mean, he was a, you know, kind of a jack of all trades because that's, that's the way healthcare was um, when he was a practicing uh, healthcare provider. Now it's specialization. You're going in to see, you may be going in to see your primary care doc, and if, if, if they think you need a cardiologist or a neurologist or, or some kind of a specialized service, they're going to refer you out. They're not going to put it with you. They're just going to, you know, provide you with an office visit, provide you with a referral, and, and send you on your way. One of the things that, that we also talked about uh, with technology, um, it, it is a especially in hospitals, seems like. Um, it's a prestige kind of thing. It, it allows hospitals to attract, um, you know, the more technology they have, you know, they, they can attract. It's, it's a prestige kind of thing. They can attract and the ability to hire um, the movers and shakers in any community or, or bringing in movers and shakers from outside the community. Um, it does, for the most part, improve overall outcomes of, of you know, within a, um, within your treatment plan. Uh, and there is an overall kind of demand in the consumer, in, in the consumer market, um, to go see a provider that seems to have all the new bells and whistles and seems to be up to speed on, on all of the new changes in technology. And then we, we, we spent a fair amount of time talking about the different types of markets. So if you looked at the spectrum on one end of the spectrum, you've got, you know, monopoly, um, you know, single seller, many buyers, price setter, uh, usually in a situation where price is greater than marginal cost. And, you know, because of that, uh, they produce um, fewer units and charge a higher price for those units they do produce. And so it, 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 it drives the government's crazy because, a con, you know, monopolists are typically viewed as um, markets where they're inefficient. And policymakers are constantly watching the monopolists to see um, what the market looks like for, um, you know, the monopolistic uh, market and how it's going to impact society. And then up here on the other end, you've got your, you know, perfect competition, um, you know, Monopolists are, you know, barriers to entry because of brand loyalty. And, you know, the only game in town, the 800-pound gorilla, perfect competition. Man, it's like easy entry, easy access. Everybody's producing a homogeneous product, uh, perfect information, you know, many buyers and sellers. Um, 
marginal revenue is equal to market, you know, profit is set by the, the market and on any, each individual firm's um, demand curve. It, it's a horizontal man, demand curve where price is equal to marginal revenue. Um, monopolists, price setters, uh, competitive market, price takers. There's just too many buyers and sellers to really impact uh, the price. Um, again, I like to go back to uh, my background is growing up on a dairy farm and we produced corn and soybeans and um, a lot of grains too because you had to have something to feed the cattle. And uh, when it came time to either buy or sell, you know, corn or, or you know, whatever commodity I needed, I always knew that I could go to the Board of Trade or the Mercantile Exchange and I could get the spot price. And it didn't matter, you know, corn is corn. Number two, you know, number two grade corn, you know, it's, you know, my corn, your corn, anybody's corn, it's going to be the same corn. So the price is set. And that's what they're talking about from perfect competition. It's just, it, it's just to some extent, um, I'm not going to impact the price and you're not either compared to monopolistic, you know, monopolistic market. And they're going to drive price. They're going to be the price setters. And so you got them out here on these two tails. And in the middle, you've got monopolistic competition and you've got oligopolies. Oligopolies, you know, very few sellers or very few producers uh, can be multiple buyers. Uh, and, and remember, when, when you're talking about, you know, oligopolies, it's, you know, mutual interdependence. So, you know, if you're an oligopoly and I'm an oligopoly and we're functioning in the same market, I have to be aware of what I do because it's going to impact me. It's also going to impact you and vice versa. I've got to be concerned about what you're going to do, what your decision process is, because it's going to impact you and it's going to impact me. And that's what you're talking about, uh, mutual interdependence. Uh, you're, you've got some barriers to entry on, you know, on an oligopoly, not, not to the level of, uh, of a monopoly, certainly, and then you've got you know monopolistic you know competition, and it's um, for the most part many buyers and sellers, but they like the oligopolies. They can have differentiated products, not necessarily homogeneous products. That's when we talked about you know talked about advertising and brand loyalty and and things of that nature. And um, you just want to make sure that uh, that. When you're thinking about these, you know, chapters seven through thirteen, you think about, you know, those four basic markets. And um, some of the videos I've gone through, I, you know, I go through and I and I provide you with uh, a very a very good, uh, I guess, summary comparing the four markets. But you need to make sure you understand those uh, those markets. And then we talk for a few minutes about, um, let's see. Well, we talked about you know shortages, and that's where we come at shortages and surplus in in the healthcare marketplace. And you know, Adams again goes back to Adam Smith. You know, invisible hand drives markets to equilibrium. If there's shortages or surpluses, either one, there's going to be pressures. You know, price pressures that's going to eliminate uh, the surpluses or the shortages, depending on which one it is. Uh, and one of the reasons that it that it works that way, especially in a competitive market, is the easy entry and access. If there are economic profits in a competitive market in the short run, they're not going to be there in the long run. If you've got economic profits, you're going to have more firms because easy entry and access, more firms are going to come in and they're going to drive those those profits down. If you've got economic losses, you're going to have firms leaving that competitive market. And as they leave, it's going to help uh, reduce the supply and it's going to help bring those prices up. So uh, very important when you're out in the in the workplace to understand what kind of a market that you're functioning in. You're functioning in a monopoly. You're functioning in an oligopoly. Functioning in a monopolistic competition. You're functioning in a perfect competition. And sometimes they get blurred, but you have to understand what market you're, that you're actually functioning in. 
And then we, we threw out, well, I can't remember what chapter that was, but we threw out uh, Pareto efficiency. And, you know, it's economically efficient outcome in society in which it is impossible to improve the situation of one individual without hurting someone else. No ability to improve the situation for everybody. And the government's view of Pareto optimality is to go back to societies. The government intervention tries to tries to maximize the benefit to society. And what did we say maximizing that benefit was to society? Societal marginal benefit, SMB, set equal to society's marginal cost, SMC. Once you set those two equal, then it's going to be the net benefit to society is going to be maximized. And then we, we spent a few times, a few minutes talking about uh, public goods. And there, there's public goods and there's publicly provided goods. And the real difference between public goods, to me, between public goods and publicly provided goods is that publicly provided goods are driven by tax dollars, public schools, parks, local parks, national parks, um, sidewalks, streetlights, sewers. Um, they are publicly provided goods. And <clears throat> the differentiator for public goods is really non-rival, means it can be enjoyed by many consumers simultaneously, non-excludability, uh, there is no payment, so you have to worry about, you know, free riders, um, and they're not usually generated in a public sector or by a public firm, and a lot of that rationale is the public uh, or a private, they, it, it's usually generated by a private, it's not generated by a private firm because a private firm has trouble determining the marginal benefit and the marginal cost simply because there's not enough information available, plus why do firms generate goods and services? Profit. It's really difficult because of things like free riders and um, you know non-excludability and non-rivalry. It's really difficult for a private firm to generate profits if they're trying to provide a private uh, public good. The one thing that that you do see sometimes on a public good is that um, local county, state, federal um, agencies may subcontract to consulting firms to provide the public goods, but it still flows back uphill to the government agencies providing those goods. Uh, and then we've talked about, uh, you know, monopolies. We've talked about uh, you know, especially with a monopoly, there's there's no close substitutes. That's why they're the 800-pound gorilla. They have market power. They have barriers to entry. They actually get long-run economic profits in a monopoly because they are the only game in town. They are the only producer. And again, they're price setters. The, the market and the firm demand curve is downward sloping on a monopoly because, again, the market demand curve and the firm demand curve is one of the same. Again, only game in town, one and the same. They set the quantity based on marginal revenue equals to marginal cost. So they come up with the equilibrium quantity. They read directly up to the demand curve, which is downward sloping. They go across to the vertical axis and that's going to give them their price. So they set their price based on marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. But at the end of the day, they produce fewer units than it would be considered by the government, especially as being optimal, and they charge a higher price than the government would consider to be optimal. And so they generate uh, an, e an inefficient equilibrium solution, and that is why the government spends so much time monitoring monopolies. That's why the government jumps right in the middle of what their perception of market failure is. Um, government agencies promote efficiency and equity in healthcare market, uh, and they do it by a lot of, I guess we call them programs. Um, they, 
you know, sponsor redist redistribution programs, Social Security, Medicaid, um, EBT cards that you see individuals, electronic benefit transfers. And it's basically th that's taken the that's replaced the foods, the old food stamp program. You've got, you know, WIC, uh, women, infant, children. Um, so you've got a lot of these redistribution programs that the government sponsors. They levy taxes, you know, levy taxes because somebody's got to support these programs. Um, and they also um, impose laws and regulations. Again, go back to how the government loves to, to dabble in trying to control the supply and demand of, of health care providers, whether it's nurses, physicians, um, you know, support staff. The government loves to try to control that. And then we, we talked about just for a few minutes about um, you know, not for profit and for profit. To me, it's nothing more than just a tax um, classification. Um, for profit, not for profit. They're all trying to earn. They're all trying. They're being driven by profit maximization, which you usually find or or for profit. Try to get into niche markets. Uh, try to get into niche markets where they. I don't want to say they're operating um, in a monopolistic fashion, but they're kind of down on that tail end of, of um, the spectrum where it's either monopolistic or oligopoly. They're, they're kind of down on, on those ends. Um, whereas not-for-profit, they're more up on the end of that distribution where it's a monopolistic competition and you know pure competition, lots of buyers, lots of sellers. They try to get hooked up with uh, managed care organizations. When you know, when I worked in the Buffalo market for Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, we were the we had probably forty five to fifty percent of the market locked up. Um, one of the other blues plants in the state of New York had some unbranded business, kind of a little regional farm. There were two or three other regional farms. Centene, a national player, was you know in the market. Um, so a lot of your provider groups. They wanted to be in everybody's network because they felt like that if they were in every health plan's network, it increased the probability of health plans sending business their way. So um, that, that's what you typically see in kind of not-for-profit uh, type provider groups. Uh, they depend a lot on managed care organizations. For-profit, they're trying to generate those niche markets, those niche markets where they can control not only the quantity, but the price that they charge. Um, and again, just, I, 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 I can't stress enough, go back and make sure you understand the difference between a monopoly, oligopoly, monopolistic competition, and perfect competition. Those from a market perspective and Again, not only healthcare, but any market economy that you go to work in, it's going to be extremely important for you to understand and be able to determine what type of market that you're working in. Uh, that's all I've got for this review. Um, so uh, I guess we'll call it call it the end of the day at this point. So um, next time I see you, we'll have another topic to talk about. Thank you.